Hello, I'm Admiral Bumblebee, and I spent way too much fucking time with Spiff. So if you have not watched the Soothe review, then you need to do that first, because that contains some prerequisite information necessary to understand how Spiff works. Let's talk about how Spiff works. In order to understand Spiff, we need to understand human hearing. The most basic tenet of musical hearing is the octave. Essentially, we take a frequency, like 10 Hz, and in order to jump up an octave, we double that frequency. In order to jump up another octave, we double it again. Then again, then again, then again, then again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. In only 11 octaves, we will have exceeded the range of human hearing. But what about our discrete Fourier transform analysis? How does that work? Well, unfortunately, it splits everything equally. If we have a 2048 sample window at a 48,000 Hz sample rate, our first 128 bins go from 0 to 1,500 Hz. That's over 8 octaves for 128 bins. 75% of our hearing is represented by 6% of the FFT's data. That's not good. We can fix that, right? We just use a larger FFT window. Then our frequency range is covered nicely. In the Soothe video, we talked about how your FFT window controls your time resolution. So if you have a 16,000 sample window, you'll only be getting data back about three times a second. That's not very good. So we explained before that you can use overlaps to increase your time resolution. Let's take our 16,384 sample window, which is 2 to the 14th power, and let's give it the same time resolution as 128 samples. That'll be nice and fast. Oh, well that's a problem. We need to overlap 128 times for that. So we're spending a lot of CPU power calculating 128 16,384 sample FFT windows. Wow. That's 99% overlap. So we definitely have a trade-off between frequency resolution, time resolution, and CPU power. Let's continue to build a foundation for understanding SPIF by talking about linear phase filters and how they react when used at low frequencies. In both of these graphs, the green line is a minimum phase filter, which has phase rotation as we've discussed before in other videos. The other filter is a linear phase filter. If you look carefully, you will see that the linear phase filter is not as accurate at lower frequencies, but the minimum phase filter is much more accurate. As the name of the filter implies, linear phase has linear phase. There is no phase rotation. Minimum phase does have phase rotation, which is something that you need to be careful about. But there is another trade-off. This is what is called step response. This is how the filter responds when the input goes from all zeros to all ones. The minimum phase filter, which is green, starts doing stuff at exactly zero milliseconds, as you might expect, and then fades off into affinity. Never Linear phase filter, however, starts before this signal comes in. What's that all about? Well, that's called pre-echo, and you can see how at about 50 milliseconds, we have a signal that's 40 decibels down. In real life, you would hear this as kind of a badump or a kachink or some sort of other sound that sounds like a flam on a drum. Nothing is free and the world sucks. Now it's time to talk about transient detection. And this is fairly simple. What we do is we detect the amount of energy in the signal and then watch for sudden changes. Not really. The compressor acts upon a threshold. It reacts to when the volume passes something. But if the audio never passes that threshold, then nothing happens. It is completely dependent on the level of the audio. So let's look at how transients are detected again. First, we determine how much quote unquote energy is in the signal for most of the time. Then, when there are sudden changes in the amount of energy, we can think about it in terms of relative change. In the image above, even though they are both different amplitudes, the sudden peak is a 1 to 4 change. If that lower signal was in a level dependent processor, it would never hit the threshold. But when we consider the amount of energy change, then we can find those peaks without needing a threshold. If you watched the video about Soothe, then this will be familiar. I ran some pink noise through Spiff with most of the settings maxed, and then this is what I saw, a Fletcher-Munson curve. 
In the lower left, you see what is the response of the human ear to various frequencies. In the larger picture, particularly in the red, is how Spiff responds to various frequencies. Hmm. In the Soothe video, we saw that the bypass caused some clicks. But with Spiff, bypass works absolutely beautifully. As long as you use the bypass inside Spiff and not the evil host bypass. Now to how the actual product works. You can run Spiff in either cut mode or in boost mode, but not both simultaneously. The depth mode changes how severely the filters react. The sensitivity knob changes that energy ratio. What ratio is necessary to trigger it? The decay knob changes how fast things go back to normal. The sharpness changes how narrow the filters are. And the decay LF slash HF changes the ratio between the decay in the low frequencies and the high frequencies. Right now you can see the low frequencies decay slow. Now I can make the high frequencies decay slow. The stereo mode lets you choose between left and right, which should be pretty self-explanatory, and mid-side mode, which lets you process the mid and side channels the same way that you could process the left or right channel. The stereo link specifically lets you influence this. With stereo link at 100%, both of the sides are processed identically in response to a mixed signal. With the stereo at 0%, they are processed independently. You can make spiff process only the mid, or only the side, or only the left, and only the right. The mix parameter lets you mix in the dry signal with the thing that's affected by spiff. Trim is the output, bypass bypasses the signal, and delta lets you hear only what is being affected and nothing else. It is a very useful feature for figuring out where exactly you need to set these filters, which we're going to talk about right now. On the right side, we have what looks like an equalizer, and it is an equalizer. You have three bands that you can freely do bell, high shelf, low shelf, and a neat little tilt filter, which is both combined. And then you have high and low pass filters. So what exactly is this section doing? Spiff has at least two signal paths. First, the signal path where it detects the signal, and then the signal path where it processes the signal. The equalizer works on the detection signal. The equalizer influences the transient detection process, but it does not apply the equalizer to the processing. Only the transient process is applied to the processing signal. Next up, we have the advanced section, where you can change the resolution, which gives us an overlap of 4, 8, or 16, we can change the oversampling, which improves the accuracy of the filters. We can change the window size, which as described earlier, gives us more resolution in the low frequencies, but it will also reduce our time resolution as our frequency resolution improves. We can also change the filter types. Linear phase will be more accurate and faster most of the time, but minimum phase will work better with low frequencies. Spiff also has a neat feature in the equalizer that allows you to listen to only the band that you're adjusting. So I'm going to play this bass guitar track and show you what I mean. Along with using the delta function, which allows you to hear all of the processing that is happening, and only the processing, not the signal that is being unprocessed, or not being processed at all, I guess. Anyways, this allows you to hone in on what exactly you want to affect without having to play around with it far too long. Spiff uses a good amount of CPU. There's not much way around that. And unlike Soothe, the various oversampling and resolution and window size modes can make a huge difference in the sound. See the text companion article for more information about that. The main thing to take away from this is that compared to Melda's plain old equalizer plugin with five active bands, Spiff will use almost 13 times as much CPU and have a fairly significant amount of latency to it. With Spiff totally maxed out with ultra resolution, 4x oversampling, minimum phase filters, and a long window, it's going to use almost 182 times more CPU power than Melda's plain equalizer plugin. Mm -hmm. 
So let's do this one in reverse. Go to AdmiralBumblebee.com to check out the text companion article or look in the description below for it. Go to my Patreon at Patreon.com slash AdmiralBumblebee and give me all your money or a little bit of money. I appreciate every little bit. Spiff is an amazing thing. It won't overlap with your compressors because as we explained, Spiff is level independent and compressors are level dependent. It won't overlap with any transient plugins you have because Spiff is frequency based and other transient plugins are time based. So, is there anybody who shouldn't buy Spiff or shouldn't waste their time with it? No. Everybody should try it. Everybody should probably have it. I mean, Spiff is amazing. I love Spiff. I want to marry Spiff. Spiff is. Spiff is great. What would I do without Spiff? How did I live without Spiff? 